Welcome to the On Deck Show, a show that takes a look at people and organizations that are operating outside the scope of normal. Today, we're extremely fortunate to have a guest who's not only a key figure from the history of swimming in Canada, but has also played a pivotal role in high-performance sport across the globe for the last 30 years. Today, we're joined by Alex Bauman, currently Chief Strategist at Swimming Australia. Alex continues to be a leader and innovator in the world of sports management, and we're fortunate and excited to have him on the show today. This song, When Doves Cry by Prince, was number one on the Billboard charts July 29th, 1984, when Alex historically won the 400 IM, breaking the world record and bringing gold back to Canada for the first time in 72 years. We thank Alex for his time and we welcome him to the show. Thanks again, Alex, for making time. Hopefully, you found that Prince tribute. I, I, would, I didn't know if you knew that or if you were a Prince fan at all. Oh no, I was a Prince fan. Didn't uh, didn't know that I was number one at the time, but um, certainly remember that song very well. So uh, no, it's great to uh, to be here, Jason. Look look forward to the interview. Thank you. So I wanted to kind of roll through just some early questions um, about you, but I really wanted to spend the meet like the majority of this time on the contributions you've made to sport. Um, you know, after your swimming career. So um, just to kind of set the stage for Alex and, you know, like, um, and I, I think something that, you know, like from what I can tell, what I've read and learned about your history um, kind of was the, the starting point for, you know, your, the way you dealt with adversity. So in my research, I read that uh, your family was in New Zealand um, when you learned about uh, trouble back home. And at that point, I uh, decided to go to uh, Canada. You were very young um, mm -hmm. when that happened. What do you remember about arriving in Canada and that time in general? Yeah, it, it was quite interesting because um, just, uh, I guess, from a historical perspective, I was born in, in Prague and um, we moved to New Zealand in, in 67. And uh, my father taught at Canterbury University in, in Christchurch. Um, and then, you know, when, when the tanks moved in, in, in 1968, a long time ago, people obviously <laughs> wouldn't remember it. Uh, we decided uh, not to go back, and, and my father actually got a uh, position at Laurentian University in, in, in Sudbury teaching sociology. So uh, I guess, uh, I mean, I do remember quite a bit. I was only three at the time, but I do uh, remember then five when, when we actually moved over to Canada. We, we uh, arrived in December, and all I remember is uh, the plane landing in Sudbury with, with snow everywhere. Right? So that was my. Uh, First introduction to to Sudbury and obviously my first Canadian winter as as, as well. Mm. I can imagine that the environment would have been quite different. Um, I also noticed, and I just wanted to kind of, if you could share on where you thought this came from. But again, from my research, like I watched some interviews of you, you know, um, when you were quite young as a swimmer, um, you know, uh, and. Um, you were always a very composed and a very well thought out speaker. Was that something that came to you naturally? Was that a family trait? No, I, I think, um, yeah, not sure it was a family trait. Um, you know, I think it's something that you have to work on. Uh, I was pretty precocious um, from the age of nine and, and, and 10, uh, certainly with, with my swimming. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of grew into it and, and uh, that there was a bit of a spotlight uh, from that age on, and, and um, as you do more interviews or as you speak, then then you get better at it as 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 well. But um, I, I think it's a learned trait, to be honest. I mean, some people probably have it, um, but but I think uh, just with practice, like anything. Fair enough. Um, I, I want to touch briefly on uh, Yeno, um, and just hoping that you could share a little bit about your time with him. Like, see, Yeno Tahani was was your coach for all your career, with the exception of a short time when you're at Indiana. Um, and um, you mentioned, or you've said, or credited him with being a father figure to you, and so on and so forth. What um, what impact did Yeno have on your coaching career and who you are today? Oh, incredible impact. Um, 
you know, I often say that uh, I saw Yeno more than I saw my father from from the ages of nine till about uh, 20, 23 when when I retired. Um, you know, we were in the pool five hours a day, and he helped me through uh, a lot of adversity. You, you mentioned that at the beginning, uh, my my brother dying in. Uh, 1980, and then um, I had a serious shoulder injury in, in 1981 um, that, that took me really uh, about a year to to get over. And um, those were the times that he really helped me out. And then my father passing away in 1983, about a year before the games uh, in in Los Angeles. So he was he was a father figure. I mean, um, you know, he he was new to the university. Uh, at, at Laurentian, there was a new pool built um, at the university, and um, he was a professor of child development, and uh, he did coaching in his spare time. But he was very passionate about coaching. And uh, my brother uh, actually joined uh, joined the club first. He was eight years older than me, um, and uh, I, I just wanted to to um, try try swimming. And I, I never liked to to work out really. I just liked to fool around, but. Uh, it was within about five or six months um, that that I uh, started to be coached by by you know and that uh, relationship um, you know grew and, and ultimately uh, I credit him uh, for for the performances that I had during my career, but particularly the, the LA games in 1984. Yeah, um, I recently did an interview with Tom Ponting, which who I'm sure mm -hmm. you remember. Yeah. Um, and uh, he recalls a moment where um, you and Dr. Tani are sitting down and he uh, he scribbles down four splits um, to break the world record and just kind of slides them across the table to you. And you just look at them, look at them and look at him and say, yes, I can do that. Um, mm -hmm. So that, I mean, like that level of confidence, I mean, like he obviously knew you very well. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, knew how to, you know, to motivate you and so on and so forth. And like you've taken, I mean, to say you've had an impact um, on the swimming world and sporting world wouldn't really do it justice. It's been so much more than that. Um, mm -hmm. how, how does, you know, those, how do those lessons come out today for, in what you do? Oh, I, I, I think, um, you know, there's so many lessons that I, I took from, from you know. Um, you know, I think both of us coming from uh, the former Eastern Bloc was probably um, one of the keys as well, that we had um, similar philosophies. Um, he, he would work very hard. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's too many coaches now that uh, – that our professors and, and also coach coach full time very very difficult uh, to do and he made some sacrifices with his family because he was up you know at five o'clock and probably wouldn't get home till about seven seven thirty so really really long days but he was really passionate about it and, and wanted to succeed um, you know what you talked about in terms of how do you break down the race into a, a number of parts and, and make it look easier you know when I took a look at the splits. That you know would often put in front of me, they would add up to a world record. But but I knew that I could do those splits when when you kind of break things up. And I think really um, you know th those kinds of things uh, were, were taught to me in terms of setting uh, short term goals, um, you know, still ambitious goals, reaching those goals, and then moving on to a, a bigger goal. And and that's what I did. I think from from the age of nine and and ten, I, I really didn't think that I could ever be an Olympic swimmer or break a world record until I was very close to to actually doing it. And, um, you know, he, he, he was a hard taskmaster. There, there's no doubt about that. I think, um, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say he's, he was totally authoritarian, but but he, he certainly valued the athlete's well-being as well. But he was tough. He, he got the best uh, out of you. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's um, certainly what I learned from him. But I think the aspiration to win um, certainly came from him. The aspiration to be the best that that you can be, and ultimately you have to work hard to be able to achieve that. That's fantastic, and I, I want to come back to that in greater detail shortly. Um, uh, I want to just just to shift over to the Olympics in LA, um, and um, as we kind of get through the intro of this this interview. So, um, I mean uh, that those Olympics obviously. For Canada, were you know 
quite an Olympics. I mean, uh, whether it was figuratively or literally, like you led Canada into those Olympics as the flag bearer and then you know, winning that first gold medal. Um, and uh, what do you remember from the Olympics and what do you remember from that team? Because that team as well was incredibly special. Yeah, incredible team. And I think everybody says that swimming is an individual sport, but it's not. It's, it's actually a, a team sport as well. You have numerous relays. Now you have seven relays on the agenda for, for the Olympic Games. So, you know, in my role now, I mean, the, the relays are, are, are critical uh, because, you know, our aspiration is, is for athletes to win medals, uh, but also for medalists to come back. So the more medalists we have, the, the better. Uh, because ultimately they inspire the nation or our role models, right? So, you know, I, I think um, LA was was quite interesting for me. Um, outstanding team, obviously, you had Victor Davis um, and, and Arthur Bright as well, uh, Mike West, uh, Ken Heng, um, Sandy Goss, you know, you had uh, so, so many great, great athletes. And um, it, it was a, a great games for us uh, as as you mentioned uh, in terms of the number of medals yes understanding that there was a boycott by by the eastern bloc um but i think you know for us uh it, it was important to to really put some good times so obviously winning was was number one for me but then the secondary goal was to try to break the world record as well but i do remember uh, you know walking into the stadium uh, la coliseum with 90,000 people cheering, it, it was an incredible experience, but it was also uh, quite the pressure cooker for me because I was expected to win. I could only equal everybody's expectation because I had both world records going in, uh, 200 IM and, and the 400 IM. And then on top of that, when I was asked to carry the flag at the opening ceremonies, um, you know, that was added pressure because everybody was looking at you, you know, it was kind of the perfect time because it's prime time back home and um but but probably more than anything it was pressure put on by myself um I, I think the key that i learned at the olympics was that you know you really some things you can control some things you can influence and there's other things that you can't control nor influence and you should concentrate on those things that you can actually control and therefore i couldn't worry about what uh, the nation felt or what my parents felt or what others felt i, I could only really worry about what what i could do uh, but it was a pressure cooker, and I still remember going into that first um, heat of the forward I am and, and swam uh, well, you know, about five seconds off my best time, but it was an Olympic record, qualifying first. And then, you know, it kind of hits you that, um, you know, uh, the expectations are, are, are significant. And uh, I went into the final, went into the warm up, and I felt terrible uh, just because of, of, of the pressure. And, you know, my splits were about a second off, second and a half off per 50, which is quite significant. And, um, you know, I, I kind of started getting doubts in my head that, you know, I've, I've trained 10 years or 11 years and I'm going to get a silver medal, not, not a gold medal. But, you know, this is where the coach comes in and, and um, you know, um, gives you that confidence. And, and I, I did one thing that I never, ever did before was I did get a rub down uh, before my, my competition for that final and i did go into the pool one more time and i felt better uh, before the four i am so um, you know in the end i was fortunate to to win and, and break the world record but i still remember the last five meters of that race um it it, it really was was more relief than um, you know being ecstatic of, of, of winning right it was relief that that it's over and uh, it took a while to sink in yeah i mean uh, i can understand the last five meters because yeah, i, I if I saw it correctly from the angle, you were about a five meters ahead as you touched the wall. So it was great. Um, just quickly, I wondered if you could share your thoughts on a guy like Victor. Did, did you know him well? Oh, no, Victor and I were, were great friends. And um, in, in the end, you know, we, we really pushed each other. I know I still remember training camps that we would have and we'd, we'd push each other. You know, he, he swam the individual medley periodically at, uh, at games as well, at Como games, for example. And I swam the term breaststroke then, so we kind of complemented e each other. But we all, we both had that drive uh, to to succeed. And in effect, it was um, you know it was a bit of a bit of a competition, even though we swam uh, different events. But I I really think that uh, we we helped each each other because uh, we we would train hard. And you know I, I I saw him on social occasions as as well. But he he was a dear friend, and uh, obviously a big loss. 
uh, to the Canadian scoring system way, way back in, in, in 1989. I still listen to, to this day. Yeah, fair enough and great tribute. Um, I want to talk about leadership. Um, so your influence as a sports director has been far reaching, you know, for quite some time. Um, so a two part question. Um, how do you develop a culture that will foster performance and encourage innovation? And how can that culture trickle down, trickle down to club swimmers and coaches that feed the athletes up the performance ladder? Mm. Yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, let me let me tap a look. The first one, I guess, is that um, I believe um, very strongly in, in, in having a, a, a culture, a good culture. And, and often I, I would I would always put the word performance uh, in front of that. So it's, it's really a performance culture. Uh, but in the first instance, you need to have a, a, a pretty good strategy in terms of what you want to do. So I think the first step is um, articulate the strategy, and it could be a relatively simple strategy. Um, so, you know, our, our uh, vision for Swimming Australia and the high performance um, side is, is really uh, to win uh, when it matters to inspire a nation. It is quite simple, and, and I think sometimes we fall away from – uh, actually using that word to win but our aspiration should should be to win we won't always do it but you know we want to be the best in in the world and ultimately then that really brings that inspirational component uh in as well i still remember being ceo of queensland swimming just before the sydney games in in 2000 and the performances that the australian team had in sydney really increased participation in Queensland by about 15% the, the next year. So there is that inspirational uh, component. So once you you kind of do the strategy and, and keep it simple, I really believe that you need to keep the strategy simple. When I first came on board with Swing Australia, we had a 72-page document. Nobody's going to remember that, right? And if you can't really fit it down to one page, but obviously have a, another one that has a little bit more detail that's, you know, eight to ten pages maximum, then, then you struggle for people to really get on board with that because uh, it has to be ownership by athletes and, and coaches as, as well. But I think once you have the strategy, then you really have to concentrate on, well, what is the culture that you actually want? What is that performance culture? And it really revolves around values and behaviors. And so, you know, our values are courage, uh, unity, and excellence. And, um, you know, courage that we have to be ambitious with what we have to do. We want to be innovative. We want to take risks. We have to take risks in high performance. Otherwise, you're not going to get the results or calculate the risk because we're, often we're dealing with uh, government funds. The continuity part is, um, or the unity part is, is really about collaborating with purpose. I don't believe you, you, you just collaborate for the sake of collaboration, but it has to, has to be purposeful. And then finally, excellence is, is trying to be the best um, best in the world. We, we want to be the best in the world. So once you kind of have values, and they can be different values. I mean, integrity, you know, there's a number of values that respect, you know, those kinds of things. But those are our three values. And then, you know, it's those behaviors that line up with those values. And um, I think, I believe in an organization, uh, you need to have those open and honest conversations where you can be challenged. And, and you can challenge us as well because you get to a higher level, but you can only do that if you have trust in the relationships, you have a strong strategy. And then, you know, with those behaviors, you can call out behavior that's below the line or recognize a behavior that's above the line. But it takes time to build this and it, it has to, in my view, grow organically. Um, so it's not just top down, it's, it's bottom up as, as, as well. But the behaviors are the key. And when an organization is taking a look at, at putting some behaviors together, you don't want to have too many behaviors because people want to remember them. Um, but it is kind of ensuring that, that um, we have those open and honest conversations. Um, often they're called critical conversations where you can put everything on the table. And I think we've veered away from that in this politically correct world. We're scared of offending people. There, there's a way to do that, right? I mean, you know, it, it does take a skill set to, to, to really be able to challenge. Uh, but I think you do have to, have to go there. So uh, I think culture uh, is much stronger than strategy. It is the key enabler of strategy. It takes time to develop, and you don't do it just in one workshop. Uh, you can't. You have to work on it on, on a day-by-day basis. But if you get that culture right, 
um, and there's alignment between athletes, coaches, and staff, then you know you can achieve some some great things. I guess in relation, well, how does that really translate to clubland or you know um, the, the system itself? Uh, I believe in this philosophy of you know performance-driven, coach-led, athlete-focused. And coaches need need to lead. That doesn't mean that they make all the decisions, but they're the ones that have the greatest impact on on their athletes. And therefore, they need to drive the culture. Sure, it can come from the top in terms of what you're trying to achieve, but ultimately, coaches have that direct relationship with with their athletes and and can really visualize what what needs to be done. So you have to be ambitious. You have to instill confidence uh, in in athletes that they can actually achieve. You have to be technically correct as 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 well, and I think then that leads to really driving a true performance uh, culture. That's interesting because uh, I mean, if I just kind of summarize, like I put the two pieces together, it's almost like an ecosystem where you ha- you inspire a nation, and that inspires kids to come into the program mm-hmm. and then your trickle down effect in terms of empowering coaches bring those kids brings those kids back up through the program so it's a, it's a really interesting um uh way of looking at things that 72 page document i found that interesting so <laughs> this is something that i i find that organizations people even myself at one point like i was guilty of like this idea mm-hmm. that if a document is longer it's better if there's yeah. more in there, it's better. But really, when you you end up just kind of pulling it apart, you see that there's a lot of fluff, and you got to root down to the core of what it exactly mm-hmm. is you're trying to say. Um, so uh, you talked about it. Uh, I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on on why organizations tend to believe that more is better. And I'm also curious what was like. What did you leave in that document mm-hmm. that is kind of the foundation of what you do now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure why. Why um, often, when you take a look on the government side, you can understand. You know, things become bureaucratic and, and become very long. But um, I think sometimes people um, try to put way too much detail in in a strategic document, and um, ultimately, even operational plans should be uh, rel- relatively simple. And, and that's really your action plan for 12 months or, or whatever you revisit that on an ongoing basis. But um, in, in the end, you, you do have to keep it simple because if, if you have a 72 page document, people don't know what your focus is. Um, you have to have clarity in your document. That's why I always believe in it. Really, you can have an eight pager or 10 page uh, strategic plan, but in the end, you can you should be able to put it on one page. And what I see as critical um, on, on the one page is, is you, need, you need to have your vision. Uh, you need to have your mission. You need to have your philosophy, which which I talked about a, a little bit in terms of performance driven, coach led, uh, athlete focused uh, through you know integrated support. Um, you also need to have some of the strategic drivers that will will kind of push um, your strategy or the ecosystem, as as you mentioned. And that the, the the key strategic driver for me is people. If if you hire the right people, then you know, I, I think you have a better chance of executing and implementing a, a strategy and uh, and getting what you need out of, you know, performances. Obviously, you have some goals as well. You know, our goal is to be uh, consistently number two in the world on the Olympic side, number four on the Paralympic side. Um, you know, we're, we're probably not at uh, aiming for number one yet because the U.S. Is, is, is very strong at this point in time. But at some point in time, you, you'd like to say, well, we want to be the best in, in, in the world. But we don't really put a mental target in the strategy itself. That sits to the side uh, because this is a long, longer term document. This is really up until 2028 at this point in time. And then with that, and so the strategic drivers, innovation, intelligence, um, you know, th- those things are, are some of the other strategic drivers. But people is, you know, people are, are number one, but they can't. Um, conflict with the strategy. The strategy has to be key and people need to align to that. And then you have, you know, four or five pillars uh, underneath. So we have, you know, for example, coaching and high performance program leadership, again, emphasizing that coaching is our number one priority. Then we have the daily performance and competition environments. We have also um, um, the third one, world leading performance, fourth, the fourth one, 
as, as uh, really coach and athlete development, which is that sustainability piece. It's a pathway talent identification and development piece. And then finally, it's the innovation piece. So you really have, we have five pillars within, within the strategy itself. But, but it's relatively simple. People understand what we need to do. And it, it's clear. And I think the other thing with a strategy, like you do need to bring people on the journey. So when you're kind of formulating a strategy, you need to get input from, from key stakeholders to, to ensure that they believe in the strategy as well. You can't just, it's very easy to write a strategy and say, here's the strategy. But if you really want to execute and implement, um, then I think you need others because you can't do everything yourself. You know, Canada is very similar to Australia, where we have uh, states we work in a federal model. Uh, Canada's provinces, you know, and sometimes it's difficult to get that alignment, and that's why you need a clear strategy to provide that leadership. Yeah, thank you. interesting. Um, when um... I want to I want to go back to people and empowerment. So um, it, it's uh, again something that I, I took out of my my research for this, but also what you just said: um, compliance versus innovation. So when you're in a government setting, often like you can be restricted by you know the idea that this is how we do things and this is how we've always done it. Um, I know that you're, as you mentioned here, you're a big proponent of people. So can you just give me your thoughts on um, the what weight you put on empowering people and yeah. trusting those people to then go and innovate and find the next ways, better ways of doing things? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the world has shifted. So I'll go in, in two parts. One, I'll go with staff, but I think it's also very relevant for athletes. And, and, and coaches as well. So uh, I, I do believe you need to empower. It, it has to be based on confidence. So this is why I say you have to make sure you have the right people in, in the tent as, as, as well, right? But, um, you know, then you, you have to give them the, really delegate the authority so, so they can be uh, innovative. You know, I, I think sometimes there's a, a, a belief that accountability equals compliance. It, that, that's not really the case i mean there has to be accountability for performance you know whether you have key performance indicators uh, within their the own own individual performance plans um where you get into trouble is is compliance where it's actually an impediment to making decisions um and often you find that in in bureaucracies or, or government departments although you know i worked in new zealand and, and that was a government uh, agency uh, responsible for high performance board and you know in high performance, as you know, you have to have urgency. There has to be urgency in being able to make decisions. You still need to make decisions based on evidence. But for example, you don't need necessarily 100% of the evidence to make a decision. Uh, you may need only 80% to make that decision because you know if you get 100%, the time frame to get 100% is, is is blown out, and you can't make decisions in, in a timely timely manner. So. Uh, I, I really do believe that you have to hire the right people in the first instance, and then you have to let, let them get on with it. Now, with with coaches and athletes, I think it's it's relatively the same thing. Um, you know, you have to give uh, coaches um, uh, or, or at least delegate or empower them to, to be able to have those performance discussions with their athletes. In addition to that, I, I don't think we, we are in a model, although we still have uh, perhaps some coaches around sports, this is not necessarily in swimming, that are quite authoritarian. I think now you, you really have to empower the athlete. You have to put the responsibility back on the athlete for, for their own performance. And um, that, that sometimes takes uh, a, a bit of skill. The athletes have to want it. I mean, it can't be really authoritarian where you're autocratic and tell them that, uh, you know, that, and, and to be honest, there have been very uh, successful coaches um, and there still are coaches uh, like that. But I think in this day and age, uh, we, we've shifted to empowerment that they actually um, want it. They take responsibility for it. And um, if not, then then I think there's, there's a problem. So um, it, it is about people. It is about in, empowerment, but it is based on on confidence. Like you can't really empower or delegate if if you don't feel confident that that person can actually do the task or or, or do the job as as well. And, and it's it's more skillful now. Um, you, you know, coaches have to understand that they have to treat athletes differently given the environment that we're in. 
uh, currently. But you still have to have those performance discussions. If you don't have those performance discussions, then um, you're not going to be able to reach uh, the goals that, that the athletes want. And obviously, as an, organi- as an organization, we want. Yeah, that's interesting. And it leads well into my next uh, question. When you talk about innovation, I mean, innovation is, you know, it goes runs hand in hand with pushing boundaries, finding different ways to do things and challenging norms and stuff like that. Oftentimes, when you get into situations like that, um, kind of like you mentioned, if you don't have the right people, or maybe even if you do have the right people, right, um, you always run the risk of developing a blame like a blame culture this yeah. didn't work because or it's your yeah. fault because and stuff like that and i'm curious like you as a leader um how do you avoid that and if you find mm. yourself entering into a situation where that exists how do you pull an organization out of that yeah it's um it's a very good point and i think you know we, we do and the one thing that i did notice coming back to australia after you know with 10 years or 12 years uh, away, um, you know, incredible blame culture um, ac- across the board. It, it's it's not just in, in sport. It, it, um, it is in swimming, you know, where, where you know, um, it, it's easier to blame someone else and take responsibility. But I, I think the, the way you get around it, and, and we're starting to, I think we have a much better culture now, is that you, those relationships have, have to be strong. So it has to be uh, great engagement. I think what COVID has, has taught us, and, and that's one positive thing from, from COVID, is, is we're starting to engage much better. Now, it still may be on Microsoft Teams or through a video or, or something like that, but we're engaging with the athletes better in terms of athlete leaders. We're, we're engaging with the coaching group. We're engaging more with staff. And I really do believe that... Um, if you have those relationships and, and those discussions and really push the need to be solution focused and ensure that people have input into uh, what you're trying to do, then, then I think you, you, the, the, the blame culture starts to dissipate. But it, it's still, you know, I, I think there it's, it's a matter of holding people accountable, making sure that they're responsible for their actions and, and not trying to um to to blame because you know for me that's below the line behavior you need to take responsibility or if for example you know i do something wrong or someone else does something wrong, you, you need to just accept that and say listen uh, I, I, you know uh, uh, we, we shouldn't be afraid of, of letting people fail uh, as long as those uh, people are, are actually learning uh, from that and that's you know in, in the end you know we we do have to take risks and, and we will make mistakes but, but that's all right, I think, as, as long as you can learn from them and move on. Mm. I mean, uh, with with somebody like you at the helm, it's it's I guess it's kind of easy to visualize how that solution, um, you know, could how those could be solutions and be put into place. Um, just a follow up question, you know, from an organization organizational standpoint, with a toxic leader, you mm. know. Um, is that organization doomed or, I mean, like, I, and I, I'm just, I'm thinking about this from a hypothetical standpoint, if I was an employee or if I was part of a team and I felt that the leader was developing that blame culture, mm. what do you do? Well, I mean, it's, um, it, that, that's a difficult one, right? Because, um, uh, you, you can have a, a fantastic strategy, um, written down on paper. And but if you can't execute the strategy, or you have a leader that that is a micromanager, it can't delegate appropriately. Then you start to create a, a, a toxic culture where there's not enough trust. You know, there's not enough open and honest conversations. And, and you know, if that leader doesn't provide a safe environment to have those conversations, and that's that's a problem. Um, so it's not easily fixed. Um, you know, that the board has a responsibility, obviously. But, you know, I do think that, and this is, this is, you know, very, very difficult for people to speak up if you have a toxic leader, um, because then they don't feel safe that they can actually say anything. And then it's very difficult. Well, how do you actually move a person like that on? It, it's not, it's, it's not easy. Like someone has to make the decision, but it's probably not the staff underneath that leader that, that, um, you know, make, makes the decision. They can perhaps, um, voice, voice their opinions, but, it's not easy if you don't have that safe environment. Yeah, fair enough. 
Fair enough. Um, you know, you deal with a lot of big personalities and you've talked a lot about people and so on and so forth. I know from my research um, that the right tension, the right type of tension, you look at as a good thing. Can you speak a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. I, I think there has to be tension. Otherwise, you're not, you're not going to perform. I, I, I think, you know, if you have too much tension, then that, that, that's where it causes the issue. I, I'll always remember, um, you know, one of the, the super rugby uh, coaches um, of, the, of the Hurricanes in, in, in New Zealand, you know, had a big poster of, 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 of a Marlin uh, in, in, in the dressing room. And, um, you know, uh, if, fishing for Marlin, if, 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 if your, you know, line's too tight, uh, you, you're going to lose the fish, right? But conversely, if the line's too loose, then you're going to lose the fish as well, right? So there needs to be tension in relationships um, because I think then we get the best out of um, e each other. Um, but as I said, it, it's the appropriate tension that you, you put on. I mean, I'm I'm a pretty hard taskmaster. I mean, I'm, I'm fairly demanding, but, you know, I, I do think that um, you need to reward staff and recognize staff uh, for what they do and, and you try to create the right environment in, in the workplace and um, but you know you can't compromise on on what you're trying to do and, and ultimately uh, for us it's performance so we often have the saying oh this is a, a, a rowing saying that um, everything we do should be based on whether you know we can make the boat go faster and if it doesn't well why are we actually doing it Right. Mm -hmm. So there'll be some things that are compliance based, as, as you mentioned before, that we actually have to do that will not actually increase performance. But we should we should really always take take a look at will it make the boat go faster? And if not, well, don't do it. And I think the other thing is that within a strategy, if things start coming in, this is why it's important to have a clear strategy. If there's other things that to get on, put on the table, but it's not in the strategy, well, you don't do it. You have a very clear path and you stick to the strategy because otherwise, you know, you try to do too much. I've seen many organizations um, do way too much. I, I always um, look at uh, Jim Collins, um, you know, who, who uh, wrote Good to Great. And um, I think he also had the uh, five stages of decay where an organization goes through significant growth in, in stages one, two and three. But, you know, they get arrogant and they get complacent and they think they know it all and they start reaching for for anything and it's not different for for high performance um you know there, there's no silver bullet in high performance and i often see organizations really put so much emphasis on innovation and, and by innovation i'm talking about technology equipment no i'm not talking about just general innovation right um rather than getting the basics right you know having the right coaches having the right facilities writing uh, having the right performance support physiology biomechanics psychology etc um so you can't get complacent and that's why there still has to be that tension yeah that's really interesting and i found it interesting you mentioned jim collins so um the the idea of tension and how you just described it do you think there's parallels and how that would operate in the business world Oh, uh, absolutely. No, I, I think so. I mean, you know, I mean, as you know, the business world is on the bottom line all the time. So there's there's tension tension around that. You know, that in high performance, um, the accountability is um, against your goals in terms of competing at the Olympics or, or Paralympics. And and, um, and and whether you like it or not, it, it, it does revolve around medals. And, uh, you know, we won't shy away from that. Obviously, there's other goals as, as well, the inspiration part, which is difficult to really measure. Um, and the community uh, interaction as, as well. But, um, you know, I, I think there's good lessons that, that can go both ways from high performance to business and, and business to, to high performance. But in the business world, as you know, it's, it's pretty ruthless, right? If, if, you, if you don't make, um, make, make um, you know, not making money, then, then it's, uh, it's very difficult and you have to, have, have to change. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, kind of staying on that pathway, if you look at, you know, um, the similarities being or and differences between society and sport, I mean, we often see sport and society at different ends of the spectrum on perspective. Con concepts like equal versus fair um, yeah. can be a challenge for some to understand as equals often confused with fair um, in our lives outside of high performance sport. Um, we struggle with this at institutional levels, you know, schools, businesses, you know, mm -hmm. even with customer service. Um, within the sport 
at club levels, often through PSOs, NSOs. Um, how do we best understand the difference between um, equal and fair? And how do we operate that way every day? And I guess a follow up, do we need to? No, I mean, it depends what level I think you're, you're talking about. And we, we have a motto that, um, you know, we'll be fair, but not equal. Um, you know, th there's no egalitarianism in, in high performance sport, you know, whether, and, and this is where we're going against the grain of society. So it is, it is difficult. And often, you know, in, in, in the public, they, you know, they say, well, why are we doing high performance? You know, why, why is winning important? And, and for me, it's the, the, the aspiration to win. You know, we just have to be careful. It's not win at all costs. For me, it's about the aspiration to win, but it's also how you win. Um, which is which is important, but um, you know it's 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 difficult. You know, I think when you're in, in club land, you know, I think you, you talk about goal setting and, and talk about you know moving from from one goal to to another goal, and, and winning probably isn't um, the the emphasis. I think when you get to high performance, I mean, when you get to the level of, of the Olympics or World Championships, then you know the the objective is 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 to uh, obviously do do your best but also to to win and as i mentioned we, we won't always win but the aspiration ha has to be there and, and um i still remember you know uh, don talbot um, who coached in canada and was on the coaching team for 1984 he passed away recently but i still remember him coming back to australia in, in 1990 um and saying well we want to be number one in the world and and nobody nobody believed him at that time um you know the u.s was was so strong you know there are other countries that were really strong um but but that was the aspiration you wanted australia to be the number one in the world and you know 92 in, in barcelona had some good results for australia 96 atlanta positive results uh 2000 obviously sydney some some great results with with the swimmers and then finally, in, in 2001, at, at the World Championships in Fukuoka, uh, Australia actually beat the U.S. on, on the gold medal count. So I think it's part of, you know, people will have to believe, you know, um, that, that it's, it's possible. It's an ambitious goal. Um, often, you know, I think it's that uh, the scientists would, would call it, you have to have those big, hairy, audacious goals. Um, you know, even Michelangelo so it's, you know, said that uh, you need to have those goals. The danger is... Um, you know that that um, we won't. It's the biggest danger is not that we won't reach our goals, but that that we'll we will we'll set our goals too short, right, or too too low when we reach them. So I, I do think you have to be ambitious, and um, you know we probably got a, a, a little bit of a topic, but but I don't see any problem in in terms of the aspiration to win, and we are going against the grain of society, but you know that that's what high performance is. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thank you for bringing up Don. Um, I, his book, I'm trying to remember the name of his book at the moment. I read it years ago, but um, it seemed like he inspired a nation when he came back because I remember his book was all about Australia winning that particular world championships. And then obviously um, the years following that, I mean, the years before and after that, I mean, like, um, you know, for, you know, through 2000, you know, for 2008, I mean, like it was, it was quite exceptional. Um, yeah. How much of that do you attribute to him? Uh, a, a large part. He, he, he was the driver, but he got the coaches on, on board with them, had some great coaches and then obviously some great swimmers and some great talent um, with, with Australia, but it needed someone to kind of unite and have that vision to be number one in the world. And, you know, to be honest, when he first got here, he had his critics in, in 1990 at the Auckland Commonwealth Games, you know, onward. But when when um, Australia started performing quite well, and it, it, it takes time. It took 11 years. Um, and I was on the board, by the way, at that um, point in time, I think 1999, 2000. Like, we still didn't kind of believe that um, it was possible to be number one, although the results were showing that, um, you know, we were much more, it was much more possible than, than in 1990. So you know he needs to he need to unite the coaches to 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 ensure that they're aligned with that as well. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I I know we're we're kind of running short on time. We got to wrap this up. So I just want to as as we do, I just want to um, kind of drag your knowledge out of the high performance area for a moment and just ask about. Um, you know, how you kind of connect the dots, because I mean, obviously, ultimately, at the end of the day, as a high performance director, um, like you oversee, you know, a very small percentage of the actual swimming population. Um, 
and you know like are accountable for quite a bit um the what you know what feeds that is a club system hopefully and i think in australia a club system a school system and so on and yep. so forth um over the last 20 or so years uh a concept like long-term athlete development has been heavily popularized. And, um, you know, I, I'm curious in Australia, how much of that is used? Is that used every day? Is that leaned upon heavily? Um, is that something that is a common tool or reference material used? Uh, well, we don't call it long-term athlete development here. Um, but we have a very strong pathway program. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, you know, part of it is that um, we don't necessarily base it on chronological age. Um, it's really maturity, uh, you know, it, it, it's really maturity as, as well. Um, and we're doing a, a lot of studies into that, which uh, have come back with some uh, real ta tangible benefits in terms of, of uh, looking, well, where does your talent actually come from? But uh, I mean, I agree. I mean, the, the challenge, I think, in Canada when I was there with LTAD was, you know, you have these nice glossy brochures, but but who actually implements. You, you need to have people to implement that, and that's really coaches, right? And so we have uh, coaches. We've, we've just kind of developed a coaching um, development strategy for, for high performance, um, and I, I just think we haven't done a, a good job on that. And, and ultimately, it's those those coaches that, that deliver um, you know, the skills, um, and sure, we can give them enough evidence in terms of what the talent is, you know, how you should kind of train. Uh, but there is a very strong pathway project, and, and the Australian government through the AIS has given us additional resources to really put in into the pathway, because I think if you're going to be a world-leading organization, um, it's, it's not about the next performance of the games. It's that repeatable result that you can get you know, from one games to another games and then having sustainability. And that that then um, separates you from other organizations if you have that sustainability. Mm, interesting. And um, I just, I want to end off on uh, your take on um, uh, a concept, an idea um, like the ISL born a few years ago, but, um, you know, it seemed, well, at least for international swimming this year, they found a way to, to, to hold, run the league. Uh, you know, if you were a swimming fan, it was quite exciting. Um, yeah. But uh, like, what are your thoughts on, on that? I mean, like, I, I don't want you to get political and we don't have to talk FINA and ISL and all that stuff, just purely from the point of view of yeah, I don't that. Mind. I don't mind. <laughs> well, yeah. You know what? Then share your I, thoughts. I, I, Give me your honest opinion. Yeah, no, I think the ISL is great. You know, uh, as long as it doesn't take away from, you know, what we're trying to achieve at Olympic Games and, and World Championships, I, I think it's an opportunity for athletes to make money. Um, it's an opportunity for athletes to compete, not as a country, but, you know, as, as a team. And I think that, that was one of the benefits that came back from uh, the ISL. I, I think, you know, personally, FINA should be doing this, um, you know, but but obviously there, there are some some uh, nuances between, between the two. But... Um, I think it's a great, great concept. I think um, different format, you know, as I said, um, you know, operate on, on teams rather than countries. Um, we just have to think, change things up a little bit, I think. Um, you know, we, we just can't have the same competitions uh, day in, day out. And it's an oper opportunity to professionalize the sport as, as well. So we're, we're very supportive. You know, we didn't um, send um, too, too many athletes this time. We had two athletes out of the 34 that were contracted, but that's, that's mainly of the of the risks that we have in the quarantine system that we have in, in Australia. But um, you know, once once that kind of goes, we're we're very supportive of the athletes attending, and, and we'll build it into our calendar as, as well. So it's positive. But I, I really think that uh, in the long run, FINA FINA needs to to change. I'm not sure World Cups are, are the best way um, to to move forward to you know give athletes the opportunity to compete and also obviously to win prize money. So. You know, I, I think um, you know we'll, we'll we'll see what happens. But I think it's positive. We're we're you know we're probably going to start a similar kind of uh, Australian swim league in in uh, domestic league at, at some stage as well. 
Yeah, it's brilliant. It's it's quite a concept. Um, I I, I, ne- I didn't attend, but I had some friends that attended the the championship when it was in Las Vegas a couple of years ago. And to think about you know a full stadium in Las Vegas for swimming was quite exciting. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. um, anyways, Alex, I know you need to go. Uh, you got to get on with a busy day. Um, truly an honor to speak. Thank you very much for making some time. And uh, Canada misses you, and we wish you all the best. No, thanks a lot, Jason. Good to see you again, and uh, I miss Canada as well. And hope to visit sometime when the international travel opens up a little bit. But no, good to see you, and all the best. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks, Alex. Have a great day. Thanks. Hey, if you like that, head over to YouTube and check out the Ocean Junction channel. Make sure to like and subscribe for more great videos featuring amazing speakers. Thanks for watching.